Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Madeline Lane Dugan, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Rufus Porter Museum of Art and Ingenuity. Located I can take in another room, and I don't have to watch. Welcome to our May 2024 virtual lecture. Tonight's presentation is with Polly Forcier as she discusses historic stenciling. Before we begin, we ask that you please have your microphone muted and your camera off. There will be a question and answer section at the end where you will be able to speak directly to the presenter, or you can simply type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen at any time. We also want to make you aware that this presentation is being recorded. For those of you who are not familiar with the Rufus Porter Museum, we were founded in 2005 and our mission is to celebrate the life, times and legacy of a remarkable 19th century New Englander through preservation and promotion of creativity and invention. Rufus Porter is well known in the folk art world for his wall murals. However, he was more than just an artist. He was a musician, teacher, inventor, poet, and founder of the Scientific American Magazine, which is still in publication today. Our museum campus is home to two historic houses, the circa 1840 John and Maria Webb House and the circa 1790 Nathan Church House, which is one of Bridgeton's oldest surviving buildings and the original headquarters of the museum. We are excited about the soon to be completed edition of our third building, the Graham Gallery. We offer permanent and special exhibits, events, classes, lectures, and other educational opportunities that further our mission. Our open season is mid-June to mid-October, after which we are open by appointment. To learn more about us, please visit our website at rufusportermuseum.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and even Twitter. If you're unable to visit us in person, we do offer an online tour on our website, as well as virtual access to our museum collection. I'd like to present our speaker for mm -hmm. the evening, Polly Forcier. As a teacher, artist, and historical preservationist, Polly has dedicated over four decades to promoting the historic art of wall and floor stenciling and mural mm -hmm. painting. After she and her husband moved into a circa 1790 home, she decorated many rooms with historic stencils instead of the more expensive wallpaper. Subsequently, she began decorating homes for friends and relatives and teaching with her growing stencil collection. As demand for historic stencil grew, Polly established her new business, MB Historic Decor. Her work has been featured in many publications throughout the 1980s to the 2020s. She serves as an advisor for the Center for Painted Wall Preservation, which preserves records of original paint decorated walls. She is the recipient of the 2022 Vermont Craftsman of the Year Award. Polly attributes her longevity and success to her genuine love of this art and the desire to make it available to others. Welcome, Polly. Oh, Molly, Polly got muted, hold on. Oh, Sorry. Sorry Can you unmute her? How oh, did she get muted? I didn't either. How is Polly muted? I asked her on the official social she'll come out. I can't unmute her. We're there. unmuted. There we go. There go. Sorry about that. Welcome, Polly. I think I'm still muted, am I not? Nope. We can hear oh, you. Everything all right. Good. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm excited to show you an overview of historic stencils for walls and floors. That being said, before we see stencils, it's significant to show you a few hand-painted walls because they led into stenciling. Okay, there were two types of freehand painters scrollers and brushstroke artists. This artisan is considered to be a scroll painter opposed to a brushstroke painter. Scroll painters are skilled at painting long graceful, graceful lines and perfect circles. Hand-painted walls were the earliest form of decoration and also overlapped the same time as early border wall stenciling, 1790. The Turner House is a hand-painted wall also by a scroller. You can see the perfect circles here. He used compasses to initially scratch the circles into the wall. That was just a guide. The skill was in painting a perfect circle every time. Side by side here, you see me tracing uh, a stencil from the Richardson Tavern in Sterling, Mass. It shows how the stencil mimicked the hand-painted wall. I'm just tracing it. 
you can see that this stencil has enabled anyone to create the appearance of a more skillfully hand-painted wall. It also has the advantage of being a one-man, speedier application. This artisan belongs to the brushstroke group of decorative painters as opposed to the scrollers, no long graceful strokes. Skilled brushstrokes were also exhibited on tinware at the time. It has been suggested that several artisans work together, each with their own color, some more skilled than others as an apprentice joined the group. We must remember that brushes were handmade and that they wore out. This is Margaret Coffin's book, Borders and Scrolls, about brushstroke and scrollers' walls, if you're interested in learning more. There's a crossover period of time when hand painting was combined with stenciling. There were never enough skilled freehand painters to answer the demand. Stencils filled that need. It's a lot like ours. Yes, it is. These two rooms uh, display a transition from early hand, from totally hand painted walls to stenciling. The hand painting is sponged around the borders, and the columns are certainly hand painted. And then the stencil is the little tulip that runs up between the two. And this last one in this category is from the Stearns Doyle House. A young man named Jotham Stearns is credited with the stenciling having apprenticed with his uncle. It seems from the name of the house that this is his or a relative's house. This was the stenciling and the stenciling, but the middle part and some of these strokes are hand painted. And I think you'll agree the brush strokes are very skilled and most likely done by the uncle. Whoever painted these strokes might well have been a skilled tinware painter. Border wall stenciling, uh, exhibits uh, some borders as architectural detail and others as imitation of airy wallpaper, 1790 to 1810. The stenciling is in the parlor here and to the right of the door. The Denisons and we have been friends for many years. We used to go to their house and pick at the wallpaper behind the door. Finally, when the kids were grown, they rented a steamer and removed three layers of wallpaper in the best parlor and found original border stenciling in the classical style. Here's the final, here's the finished parlor. See the architectural element beneath, beneath the urns. Make note of the inserted frieze. It will be shown in the next several houses as a favorite. It is painted on a serrated border of a contrasting color, which was a more expensive way of decorating the wall. Notice the sawtooth border here. And this is the completed restoration. There was an article in Early American Homes about this room. The Judge Dana House built in 1808 in Chelsea, Vermont. It was once one of the finest homes in town. It has a Palladian window, partially obscured by a blind. This shows the Palladian window interior. John Dumville, retired director of historic sites in the state of Vermont, who invited me to see this house, picked up a rake from the floor to peel back wallpaper and reveal the intersection of frieze and vine which was continuing on over this way. Freeze and the vine was coming up the curve of the Palladian window. Here at the top of the stairs is the lovely freeze. It is, a, it is stenciled on a scalloped pink band over a pale blue background. You can just make out the pink band. Notice and remember the bow and tassel, the bow and the bow and tassel here is here, enlarged here. Themes of vines as borders are often used as well as architectural woodwork borders. Seen again in the back bed chamber is the same frieze, this time on a scalloped pink band on a yellow ochre background. Now remember the bow and tassel. 
In the downstairs hallway is a later period stenciling, likely 1840s. See the bow and, stat and tassel through the, through the yellow paint? Here, here's the bow here and the bow here and the tassel. So we discover that the downstairs hall was once as beautiful as the upstairs, but that a later artisan came along and talked the owners into re-stenciling with his patterns. The original pink border can still be seen, distinguished, uh, still, be, still be distinguished close to the ceiling. This is the Lewis Chapin homestead built in 1797. The house is now owned by Dr. Stuart Alexander and his wife, Emily. So now for historical record, it becomes the Chapin Alexander house. I saw these walls with the undisputed expert of stenciled wall research, Jessica Bond, over 50 years ago. At that time, the young Alexander wanted to know what they could do with these walls. Jess advised them to leave the walls untouched if they could stand to live with them, which they have done and have hung the very lovely artwork of Emily's mother and grandmother. As a result, we have a heroic, undisturbed, historic example of fine border wall stenciling. Swags and tassels are a very popular theme. This swag is under the beam. It is a direct imitation of of the original playbook from England and France from which expensive wallpaper was printed. The egg border is an architectural element meant to imitate carved woodwork. Because you know that the walls that, that are stenciled are meant to imitate woodwork or wallpaper. And those were being imported from England and France, but they were far too expensive for most people to afford. And so the itinerant stencilers took to the road and imitated those designs with their work. Vines and leaves again are seen as a border. The fan was a popular motif at this time and on furniture. Uh, think Heppelwhite and Sheraton furniture, which was light and airy in design, matching the era of this stenciling Note the use of red in the fan. This is a different bedchamber and a heart-shaped leaf, sometimes seen with a superimposed smaller red or white heart within the black leaf. This leaf was also seen at the Queechee Inn at Marshland Farm in Queechee, Vermont. About the year 2000, I was alerted that those walls in Queechee were about to be painted over so I raced over and traced it the day before. These fans are used without the underlayer of red. Was that an oversight? Here is the favorite frieze as seen in the th all, th all three houses. This one is not seen on a contrasting border, red and black on a yellow ochre background. This is a home in Western Vermont. The basket and side bouquets are placed intermittently above the stencil chair rail. Going up the stairs, it is placed carefully upright along the expanse of the staircase. In a different house in Thetford Center, Vermont, other urns were seen tilted sideways to mimic the slant of the staircase. The owner loved those urns and called them his tipsy urns. Unfortunately, after he passed away, they were painted over. We lose these walls to paint and paper, so it's exciting to find them again under paper as these walls were recently discovered. For the frieze, our favorite stencil is placed on a gray band, mimicking carved dental molding, see the little teeth, an architectural detail on an orange ochre background. The photo at the left shows the treatment at the top of the stairs, but whatever are those big black initials? My friend Linda Lefko said, do you really think such a skilled stencil would plop his initials on such an exquisite wall, Paul? I agree with her that that is a weird idea, but I'm reserving judgment. They were uncovered as the wallpaper was torn off recently. An equal mystery are the counting hash marks on the upstairs hallway wall. By the owner's count, there are 34 days registered. 
Was that the length of time it took the artisan to study, to, to stencil the upstairs and downstairs? Stenciling was not as easy then as it is today. Then the artisan had to mix his paint, make his own brushes, and wait for paint to dry. Was the house even warm? Today, we squeeze out a tube of paint, pick up our ready-made brushes, and go to work in a warm place. The paint dries almost instantly. There is also a tantalizing, indistinguishable signature. I think I can make out an H here. Oops, in there. Ooh, I just enlarged it. <laughs> <laughs> go click down. And there's, and there's the bigger H, okay. The Dutton House at the Shelburne Museum was moved from Cavendish, Vermont in 1950. They have chosen the Erastus Gates stencil as its signage. This house once had a number of rooms stenciled with the earlier period of stenciling, 1790 to 1820, and was added to later by Erastus Gates' big pinwheel pattern when he passed through Cavendish 25 to 40 years later. But these were the original stencils, and they, they were redone in uh, 1950s. Nine, all, over wall sten all over wall stenciling in imitation of wallpaper was the style of Moses Eaton Sr. and his son, Jr. The Oliver Tarbell Homestead in central Vermont was built in 1831. The original house is seen in the back. Oliver Tarbell and his wife, Sarah, had 13 children. He attached his new brick colonial house to the old one by way of a loft door that led into the rear upstairs bedchamber right here of the brick house. My daughter, Vivian Bisbee, and I recently had the privilege of bringing to life remnants of historic stenciling. Some, as by yet an unidentified artisan, was found under wallpaper right here. The photo at right is an Eaton motif found in the back northwest room under paint. Stenciling in two rooms and two hallways seems to have been done by Moses Eaton Jr. This is the back stairwell in original condition. The front hallway is also a Moses Eaton wall, Jr. wall, restored by Jessica Bond's protege, Kathy Wall, in the 1970s. This is the side-by-side -side overmantel of the Southwest bedchamber. It is an exciting collaboration of Moses Eaton Jr. and Erastus Gates, probably in the late 1830s, when Gates was in his early 20s and Eaton in his late 30s. Gates' stencils were reportedly cut from leather with a beveled edge, and Eaton's from a heavy tag board made stiff and impermeable with oil and or shellac. Here is a stencil comparison from MB Historic Decor, cut from Mylar. This is the overmantel. In some cases, we could not capture the exact stencil design and used one from our collection, which was the same as the original. The room is completed. A collaboration of Eaton and Gates is proposed because the three leaf, the three leaf and flower stencils alternating on the wall are from Gates collection and the verticals and the horizontal rose vine and the willow trees and the flower baskets are from Eaton. An article about this restoration will be in the June issue of Early American Life. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the north wall of the northeast bedchamber. The door on the right leads to the loft of the original wooden home. In this passageway is a swath of teal green paint. To show you a bit of our process in reconstructing the walls, this is where the artisan had wiped his brush. The photographer had me hold a gray card so she could get the color to be accurate in her photos and for us to match the paint to the two rooms. Next followed my tracing as much as possible by moving the clear mylar from unit to unit. The tracings were then sent out by MB Historic Decor to be laser cut. Here is the restored Northeast bedchamber 
The yellow wall background color was found in a divot of the original plaster under wallpaper. The teal green paint was the same in this room as in the room that adjoins the old L, and the stenciling was by the same hand. The ivy vine and the block, diamond block, are repeated in both rooms. Photos by a professional photographer were used to reposition the original stencils. When I spoke to the Stevens Plains chapter of the Historical Society of Early American Decoration in Saco and mentioned the Oliva Tarbell House, my hostess, Polly Bartow, all but sprang from her chair and cried out, Tarbell, that's my maiden name. I still have cousins in that area. I must be descended from Oliver Tarbell. This story was such an exciting coincidence that the present owners invited her to come and see the restoration in process. And Polly Tarbell Bartow got to stencil some motifs in the Northeast bed chamber. Moses Eaton Jr., born in 1776, died in 1886. He lived long enough to be photographed in his old age. There are no likenesses of Moses Eaton Sr. This is the original Moses Eaton Jr. house. Is it in Dublin, Hancock, or East Harrisville, New Hampshire? There are confusing locations of this house reported because it sits at a crossroads of all three towns. This road comes from Hancock. This road goes back to Dublin and across the way it leads to Harrisville. Under the eaves of this house, at the back of the house, the original stenciling kit was found of Moses Eaton Sr. by his descendants many years later. Here's his kit. It had been given to Janet Waring, who was a family friend and a researcher, when Waring died, her sister gave this kit to historic New England, and this is how we know his name. The photo is courtesy of historic New England. A plank from a house in Antrim, New Hampshire, shows stenciling by Moses Eaton Sr. In Hillsborough, New Hampshire, there exists an entire room of Eaton Sr. stenciling. That being said, I become more convinced that I should not attribute walls to any one artisan. The only way to be sure would be to place the original Eaton stencils from his kit over each unit for comparison. Of course, the stencils wore out and had to be recut, never exactly the same. If he did not stencil this room, somebody skilled in his way of placement created a remarkable facsimile. It is in such good condition, I'll treat us to three of the walls. This is the first wall, the first and the second wall. And on the second wall is the fireplace. A special motif is placed over the mantel, two flower sprays not seen elsewhere in the room. This is the third wall behind the door, the window frame beginning to appear on the right. This is the treatment between the two windows. And the final panel of the Hillsborough House. Now we turn briefly to New York State. Here is a sample of a diaper pattern defined as an all over design in a small pattern of geometric shapes. This one is from a New York museum. Here's another example of New York State stenciling, Clifton Park, New York. It is a new wall. The owner of the house saved these stencils from an old New York wall. However, I have also seen this same pattern in Stratford, Vermont. As many artisans were leaving their mark in their travels, they were encountering each other and each other's work. Stencils were copied and exchanged. This New York State stencil has an Eaton type border in one color only without the usual red overlay. I guess I told you the same wall was in Stratford, Vermont. What do you suppose was the story behind the travels of this artisan or perhaps of his stencils. This is a close-up of two alternating motifs on that wall. Just over the New York border in Williamstown, Mass, the homeowners had a serendipitous surprise. 
a wall was uncovered that had been preserved by construction of an inner wall. Both the frieze and the flower motif resemble state stencils eaten and used, but they are not the same. Who knows what treasures have yet to be discovered beneath layers of construction or wallpaper. This is a comparison of the flower motifs of two different artisans' hands, one in New York and the other in Massachusetts. It's obvious patterns were shared or copied or remembered and recut by the artisans. Following are a few stencils used by Rufus Porter, Jonathan D. Poor, and possibly another. The Prescott Tavern at the MFA. I'm including this because I love the story. Before, and also because I come from Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Before the building was demolished, the walls were removed from the Prescott Tavern in Jaffrey, New Hampshire in 1950. They were displayed for some years in the Goyette Museum in Peterborough, New Hampshire, then mysteriously disappeared until this one was installed at the Boston Marriott Hotel. More recently, this wall was acquired by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and is installed in the new American wing. The artisan has not been identified by experts, but you'll be wondering about the dead side of the tree. It has been suggested that it stands for the conquered England after the Revolutionary War. This is the Daniel Carr House in North Haverhill, New Hampshire, photo by Wikipedia. It has a simple wall with stenciled cows, a three-story red building, and a little tower on top of a hill. The cows were evident as a stencil very early in Porter's and Poor's murals. To make them come to life, horns, white blazes, and tails were painted with a small brush. The murals in this house have been dated about 1824, when Rufus Porter was plying the Connecticut River in a horse-powered boat not far from the car homestead. His nephew, J.D. Poor, often traveled with him. The following are Jonathan Poor walls and stencils from the Dr. Norton house in Baldwin, Maine, where Poor lived at that time. They are being installed as the centerpiece of the new gallery space at the Rufus Porter Museum. Jonathan Poor, Porter's nephew, was his most prolific student. He developed his own style of painting. Principal among his differences was the addition of apple orchards, birds, figures, and broken tree limbs. This is his late in life style. Poor's birds, and here is a very good waterfall. You wouldn't guess it from this wall, but according to the authors, Lefko and Radcliffe, Jonathan Poor used fewer stencils than Porter. Boats were never stenciled, but I have broken down the layers to create stencils for some boats. They are carried in the Rufus Porter Museum gift shop along with other stencils from muraled walls. JDP, Jonathan D. Poor, his signature was not always a stencil. 1840 was about the time mural painting faded out. Poor died in 1845 but his wife died in 1842. Was he painting murals in the doctor's house as a way of paying for medical bills or to show gratitude to Dr. Norton for his care? The latest book about Rufus Porter's School of Folk Mural Paintings, authored by Lefko and Radcliffe, it gives much new information about the Rufus Porter School of Mural Painting and identification of the various artisans and their styles. The cover of the book is from the Dr. Francis Howe House in Westwood, Mass, as are the following pictures. Porter instructed painting in his little book, Curious Arts, using five distances to create the illusion of perspective. The following pictures are from Lefko Radcliffe book and feature the Westwood murals signed by Porter and his son. Very quickly, we have the first distance the first distance is the fence, second distance and the tree, second distance is the retreating fence and the home, third is the island and the little boat, fourth are the capes and this boat, and fifth are the mountains and the horizon. Note Porter's attention to detail on the fence. 
His painting was more open and spare than Poor's, and the greens were some brighter. These boats were in the process of becoming stencils. At the end of this demonstration, I'm going to give uh, a little stencil lesson using this little house as the sample. Here's a little house again. Cumulus clouds, sunlit buildings, and foliage all lit from the right-hand source of light, a window in the room. There's our, and there's our little house. And here are the cows stenciled with horns, tails, ears, and legs defined using a small brush. Sometimes Porter used fanciful types of foliage in the foreground. Some of them were stenciled. More foreground foliage and the scar of some kind of a built-in that was once on against that wall. These next photos were once slanted up a stairway. The murals were signed 1838 by Rufus Porter and his son, Stephen Twombly. Stephen Twombly Porter, who died at age 24. The little people were not a stencil, but they will be when we have them cut. The scene continues up the slant of the staircase. The dog and goats will be a stencils. And this is the end of the murals. More fanciful foliage onto floors. Floors were the first surfaces to be stenciled. It is said that early tavern keepers spread dirt or sand on their wooden floors to catch the mud and manure that was inevitably tracked in. In the Haywood Sawyer House in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, there is a floor. Besides floor, walls, floors are another surface to preserve. So few survive in place. This one is fortunately covered by carpets. A floor stencil from my dining room. The Humphreys House stencil is meant to look like a woven rug. It looks complicated, but it's not. There are only three stencils. The large solid design is laser cut on a heavier mylar to create a stiffer pattern to work with. And the delicate dots and wreath are on a, a, a finer grade of mylar. And then the yellow overlay is on the usual number three mylar. A floor plank shows the border at the top and the bottom the top and then the beginning of an all over floor decoration. Few floor stencils survived. This one was removed from a house that was demolished. The original floor from the Bump Tavern in Cooperstown, New York. And the last is the border from the Bump Tavern in Cooperstown, New York. The Victorian era had their own form of stenciling. This is the John Dumville's house. This is John Dumville's house in South Royalton, Vermont. You met John with a rake in the Chelsea house, a, John, a George Barber designed house built in 1895. And this is the last of our stencil images, a sample of Victorian stenciling. The photo is from a recent article in Old House Journal. And we have a stenciling demonstration. Okay. Here it comes. Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> okay. Here are the stencils, and I've turned up the corners to make it easy to pick them up. I'm going to make a little dot through the registration holes. Those are what enables us to center each stencil correctly. Of course, when they're brand new, you can see how they go line up with each other, but once they get paint on them, you have to rely on these little dots. So this is the first one and it's white. So I'm using one of my brushes for white. These are Joe Sonia paints. And we just use a circular motion uh, as we stencil and we drive drive the paint up into the corners. 
and then you can finish with the The sunny side of a house. So the second stencil is aligned with the first one because there is a little dot there that I can use. Also you see that it is aligned and I'm going to use my gray paint to mix up with black and white. Seems to be a little bit old. There's the shaded side. And here comes the door and the windows and the roof. This is not a messy way of doing things. It's pretty tidy craft. And the paint dries pretty quickly, as you can see. Quickly enough to almost go right in again with the next color. is the chimney. The little house, but as you can see, I reversed it. I turned all the stencils upside down and now you can see that the light comes from the correct the window in my house is to my right so if I were painting a mural all of the buildings would be lit from the right hand side in this little house the light came from the left hand side so simple Terrific. Oh. Well, now is the time that anybody can ask questions. You may turn on your camera and ask it as long as you make sure you're not talking over somebody or um, you can put it into the chat box at any time. Thank you very much, Polly. That was very interesting. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. My husband, my husband who's sitting here did ask one question um, and he asked, what keeps the paint from bleeding out? to the, what keeps it inside the actual stencils? Well, it's just that it's uh, flat to the wall. I mean, even worse would be on canvas as I demonstrated because it has kind of a, a grain to it, but on a flat wall, there's really no danger unless you're using wet paint. It can happen if you use too much paint on your brush or wet or paint that's too wet. Mm. Do you use a Swiss? Sorry, do you use a specific kind of paint? We we use Josanya paints. They're a gouache paint. Yes. Yeah. We sell paints and brushes and whatever people need. We have someone asked, they said, I live in a 1786 house in a town where Moses Eaton visited in 1790. There is stenciling on the fireplace around. Have you seen original stenciling placed in this manner before? Uh, I, I'm not sure, I don't see a picture of it. What, uh, it was, um, I don't understand the question because I can't see what she's describing. A fireplace oh. around. The black area around the, the firebox. Um, it, it's the Eaton, it's the one Eaton pattern 
Um, but I, I mean, it could have been placed there at any time. The fireplace people thought it could be original, but you're the expert. I'm afraid I can't picture how you mean. Uh, it goes around the, it okay. goes around yeah. up the sides yeah. and across the top of the mantle. No, the the top is the mantle, but yeah. the sides of the. Uh, then you have the inset fireplace, and along the sides are black strips, and it's on these black strips where there's eaten type stenciling. Well, I have not seen that. No, I haven't. Okay, it's not to say that it might not have been done. Um, they did, the people who built the house originally um, listed a large oil cloth with their possessions. So it's, it's possible it could have been original. I don't know. But I love your stencils. Just wanted to say thank you. I've got five rooms done in MB Historic. So oh, soon to be six. You. Soon to be six. Oh, Terrific. Thank if you. you have a, if you have pictures you want to send me, I can connect yeah. them to to Polly and get any a further answer from you. Yeah, I'd love to see what you have and tell me your name. My name is Susan Hines. I'm listed here as Santa. Oh, um oh Susan Hines. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank Viv's, you so much. Viv's listening. I know she knows your name. <laughs> yep, I'm just writing it down too. <laughs> yeah, Let's I could see. I don't have those pictures like immediately in front of me, but I could send them if I could send them to Madeline or to you, Polly. Yes, please either, please send either them to one will get them. Thank okay, you. Madeline, I would send it to the museum. Sure. Or... Yep. Staff at RufusPorterMuseum.org is my email address. Okay. Thank you. Susan had asked, what type of paint do you use? But I think I asked that. 59. And it was answered. Mm -hmm. Yes. Josanya paints. Josanya. Josanya. Okay. Yes. I'm writing that down. You're in a tube. Let's see. Somebody asked, your, your demonstration was done horizontally on a flat table. Is it easier or harder to stencil on a vertical wall? Harder. Oh, well, that was such a little tiny thing. It could have been done either way. It's not harder to do on a wall. Sometimes, of course, I, I didn't put any tape on that. Uh, I was demonstrating kind of the use of the brush. Sometimes when I'm stenciling a wall, I spray the back of the stencil with a with a um, um, a, a, um, an adhesive, a repositioning adhesive, and it helps it adhere and also keeps paint maybe from running under. Or I just uh, tape it with masking tape, and that goes. I just lift it and reposition it each time. And it's easier than trying to hold it with your hand because, of course, obviously. Terrific. Mm. Carol asked, do you prefer updating murals or leaving them intact, even when they're in poor condition? Leave them. Oh, I, I'm always for leaving them in poor condition. But people, if they cannot live with them, um, Yes, they they could be updated, but um, it's always sad to leave to lose the original. I hope that if they were to do something to them, they would take pictures and that they would perhaps frame a piece of the original wall um, and protect it. The best example that they can find of the original wall, but definitely uh, make note of it before anything is done to the wall. Susan asked, what type of paint that do you use on floors? Um, I think an oil paint. I don't really do floors. Oh, oh, if you're talking about the floor in my house, I just uh, stenciled it the, with a regular paint over it over the regular floor which had which was a hardwood floor and it had been protected with polyurethane and i stenciled over it with my own stencils and then put more polyurethane over that it's all water-based um sloan asked you mentioned the playbook from england and france as models for the stencils was there a specific title i missed it no i do not have a specific title i do know that there is uh available a 
book for floor stenciling, but I don't know the title of it. And it shows a lot of the patterns that were used for floors in the 17, 16, 1700s. That's the last of the questions in the chat. Does anybody want to ask a question? Unmute, unmute yourself, turn your camera on. See if anybody's unmuting. Oh, somebody says, Sarah says, do you ever put a protective layer shellac varnish? Yes, uh, on the floor, definitely. Not over wall stencils, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are old walls which have been varnished and they've turned yellow, so they're practically oh. lost. Yeah, this is Don Eilidson. Hi, Don. Hi, good to see you. Ginny did a lot of stenciling, uh, and I think there's a jar, a, a piece of pottery in the gift shop that has the man in the boat, mm. and that was stenciled by either Ginny or I, by me, I should say. And uh, she used uh, paint sticks, which, uh, and, and they were kind of pounced on. So she didn't have to worry about it going underneath the stencil and distorting the edge. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that was all done, uh, then we coated them with a, a clear uh, polyurethane. And uh, oh, we, yes. we did, uh, jars that were um, probably eight inches high and uh, um, same diameter. Uh, I also made wood covers for them uh, to be used in a kitchen or whatever. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. And But we did a, a, a room, a floor room, that had uh, a three-color um, pattern. Uh, and they pattern uh, produce a, a layer that went under and over and all the way around the room, including in a, in a bay and across and coming out of the bay. And as we finished up the room, we laid the last stencil um, on the floor. And for some God-given reason, it matched perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had no idea that that would happen. The colors <laughs> and the shape and everything. And, That's uh, just wonderful. We, what a great story. Oh, yeah. So, no careful planning, and you just lucked out. Yeah, but we did a lot of jars and uh, and uh, sold them at, at um, yeah. yeah in a uh, in in Boston in a uh, display uh, of many artists. And, Very good. Uh, it was, it was four four days long, and we don't live. We were about twenty miles from Boston, and so you had to go back each day for four days. So it was a real grind. But uh, we we both participated, and uh, she did a great job. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that, Don. They can be used for crafts other than the original reason yeah. that they were used, of course. And some of them are very pretty for that reason. But the paint sticks are great because it, it's not yeah. liquid and they're mm -hmm. kind of pounced on rather than brushed on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, but um, that's, mm. that's my contribution from Jimmy. Very good. I'm glad you're enjoying the stencils. Thanks, Don. Um, Santa asked again, um, or it's not Santa, it's Susan. Uh, on a modern stencil, parentheses, MHB wall, do you recommend any overlay preservative? You know, I wouldn't be concerned if it was a new stencil and if people were um, interested in protecting their stencil. Uh, there are some very clear uh, types of mm, polyurethane that you could try. It wouldn't be a disaster after all on a new wall if over 20 years it began to yellow. <laughs> But I'm just talking about original walls. You would never put something over them. Right. Sarah asked, historically, what is the base under the paints on the walls? Plaster? In Europe, lime was often used with a dye, for example, ochre. 
so um yeah i'm i know about the european walls um well sometimes they had uh horsehair plaster i think that's the most likely uh plaster that was used in new england maybe they had shells i don't know mixed in with some others down closer to the water so that salt water but yeah, I think horsehair plaster. Was the coloring in the plaster? Oh, the, was the coloring in the plaster? I don't think so. No, I think it was painted afterward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Betty asked, oh, okay, no. go ahead. No, you go. Yeah, well, it was considered a less expensive wall if it was done on a white wall. Mm -hmm. So it was more expensive than to apply a color, a light blue or a yellow ochre or something, and then to stencil over that was considered mm. a more expensive way of stenciling. And sometimes it was done on woodwork. Okay. You were asked, did you sand your floors before you painted the stencils on top of the floors? Let me think, I put in the new a new floor and no I didn't I put it I had a new floor put in and I had polyurethane put on it and then I stenciled it and uh oh you're talking about whether no I didn't I didn't have to the paint adhered I know what you mean sometimes people use a, a light sandpaper to be sure that the stencil paint will adhere but it wasn't necessary no <clears throat> Susan asked, how do you remove wallpaper glue when there's stenciling underneath the wallpaper? People do use, uh, they do use a spray uh, or a um, steamer. Uh, it's very hard to get it off. There's just really no way to get it off without disturbing the paint. When you pull off the wallpaper, you'll see that the back of the wallpaper has the same image as the wall stuck mm -hmm. to the back of the wallpaper. But no one's ever found a way to remove it without without that occurring. That's the last of the questions in the chat. Oh, oh, Sarah says, so interesting. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Sarah. Anybody who wants to can turn your camera yep. on and ask a question. You can you can take stencils off the wall and make them out of polyurethane to be used all over. So that's that's not a, a real problem. But the uh, the man in the boat is on a on a what a piece of crockery in the, in the gift shop. And uh, that that was done by either Jenny or me. And uh, it, it you, so you can get an idea of what a, the stencil that's in the shop, the stencil itself yeah, is copies of it are in the in the shelf, the gift shop. You know, that was the best stencil uh, version of a man in a boat that I have seen on walls. They're they're quite different. Uh, that one came from Jaffrey, New Hampshire. And I thought it was very cute. It was like a little caricature. At the time I thought that wall was done by Moses by uh, Rufus Porter. But uh, the experts say that it uh, there's an unknown artist working in New Hampshire, so they haven't identified who it is yet. But I just loved that little man in the boat. He had a caricature of a face. Yeah, he's nice. Lisa says, thank you. This was very interesting. Hope to visit the museum someday. I see a couple people are unmuted. Feel free to ask a question if you have one. Anyone else? Well, Polly, thank you very much for tonight. Um, I will, will have the video up on our YouTube page in a day or so, and we'll be emailing you all the link and a survey. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good night, Polly. Good night. Good night.